So, uh, <clears throat> Tony has been here before. He's uh, at the Naval Research Labs, and he's going to do something that will shock us all, I, I hear. I don't think it's going to shock you all. So, at first, <laughs> <laughs> at first I was going to talk about a problem that I'm researching. Um, but over the course of the first several talks, I noticed, you know, certain words popping up that have been troubling me a lot of late. So I decided to do something completely different with this talk. So I'm hoping that by the end of it, either I will have convinced you that my concerns are reasonable, or you will have convinced me that I have no reason for concern. <laughs> and, and, and Prakash, Samson Key, uh, Bob, uh, Mernoush, and Tanner, and I think that's should fight me because you're not going to hear me talk about the Bayesian order for like the sixth time in a row. <laughs> so I'm going to write up uh, a skeleton of the title of my talk and I'll fill it out as the talk goes on. So my talk is tentatively titled Complete. Did I spell that right? Yes. All right. <laughs> Completely positive. Trace. Preserving. I think so, you missed a hyphen after Trace. What's that? <laughs> no, Johnny, you don't believe in hyphens. Yeah. <laughs> so, first I'm going to give just sort of a, I guess the classical exposition about how we justify arriving at completely positive trace-preserving maps as quantum channels or operations. So, first this, this is basically if you open up a book, you know, or read a paper, or you know, like see a talk, and the author attempts to justify how you get at it. This is usually the way that it goes, right? So, of course, the setting is we have uh, some n-dimensional complex Hilbert space. And I'll say n, n of c, these are just the linear operators of the Hilbert space, so n by n uh, matrices, complex matrices. And the quantum states are the density operators. So they're the, the maps that are self <coughs> uh positive semi-definite. And with unit trace. Right, so this is stuff that everyone here, I'm pretty sure, has, has seen like several times. So, and now we say that a linear map epsilon, and usually where this epsilon lives is kind of suppressed in the papers, right? But it's a map from linear operators to linear operators, right? Is a channel. a quantum channel or operator if. So how does the justification usually go? We say, well, it's got to take states to states, right? And states have unit trace. So it's got to preserve that trace. Right? So, so that's the first condition, that the trace of a linear operator is equal to the trace <coughs> of epsilon applied to that operator, right? Or epsilon applied to that state. And then we say, well, it's positive. All these things are positive semi-definite, so this operator has to take positive semi-definite matrices to positive semi-definite matrices, right? But not only does it have to do that, but if we adjoin a larger Hilbert space, if we look at it in an ambient environment, right, and then do nothing to the environment, but just do our operation to our part, it's still got to take a state in the larger environment to another state in the larger environment. Okay, so, so this is trace preserving. And then here we say epsilon tensor the identity map on a larger dimensional space uh, is positive, right? These maps are all positive uh, for every 
pipe, and so on, for as large of a Hilbert space as, as we want to attach to it. Okay, so this is the, the usual justification for it. Does anyone have any questions or concerns about how we arrived here, about these assumptions? Yeah? Well, the concern maybe is actually happening here is that the state space density matrix is different within your printer. So the state space is actually a convex space, mm -hmm. but it's embedded in what I see. That's a standard trick that's always been played there. Right, so you're saying we're embedding this convex structure into a larger yes. linear space. Exactly. Right, right, right. That's okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll write these down, right? So, one, I just write it down as convexity. Is that, is that all right? Yeah. I mean, I think we can. All right. It, does anybody else have any, like, maybe? Well, it's not the con it's like the affine structure on probability. So uh -huh. it's actually the operational interpretation of probability which gives you linearity, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So actually, you, you should be interested in airport transformations, but you extend them to do And then you extend them in the yeah. usual way to yeah. right. vector space. Yeah. But that's kind of an operational assumption. This would be assumption zero, which leads you to linearity. Mm -hmm. Right. So well, I'll, I'll, I'll look at these in more detail, right, as, as I go on. So there's no other concerns, no other concerns at all here. Okay. I'll write a few down then. Let's see. If you believe us, you can now, man. Eh? What's that? Just believe us and say, end of the talk. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so, so here's my plan B, right? That concludes my talk. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one concern for me, right, the, this, this is one, right, justify, even justifying convexity, and linearity, I'd say, is even harder to, we have to derive linearity, right, from convexity, once we justify this, but just the justification of this, right, why, why would this be a, a concern? Um, Let's see. Are, so, so, are there examples of convex maps that aren't linear? So, here's one. Right. Let's let's say I take the map epsilon that takes any state and sends it to some fixed state. Uh, right. And this is not. Uh, we'll say this is this, this thing is non-zero. Right. So, is this convex, right? Yes, this is a convex map. Is this linear? No, are you crazy? This isn't a linear map. But, so, so here's an example, at least, of a map, right, that will take density operators to density operators if I pick this in my, in my space of states, right? That's convex, but it's not linear, right? So, so linearity requires justification, convexity, What's the argument that I usually see in books, right, to justify that? It says, okay, if I have an ensemble, right, if I have an ensemble of states and I apply my map to it, then what I should expect to get out at the end is the ensemble of the map applied to each state that goes through. Because I just imagine like a large number, right, of states where the statistical mix satisfies this distribution, right, and I send each one through individually, and what I get out in the end should be the statistical mix of the channel applied to each of the individual states, right? Now, what I say is that this reeks of the type of classical reasoning that leads us astray a lot of times when we're thinking about things in the quantum mechanical world. I'm not saying that this is wrong. I'm saying that this isn't a good justification, right, for convexity. Why is this not, not linear? Why is this, oh, this yeah. not linear? Yeah. Because, for instance, uh, for instance, if I take a, a row, right, and I take, like, let's say a scalar multiple of row, and I apply epsilon oh, to it. Oh, I thought row was normalized. You're not taking row to be normalized. Oh, no, no, no. Epsilon is going from, right, all linear maps. Okay, okay, right. The individual okay. Hilbert space to here. Mm -hmm. Okay, then, sure, it's right. Linear, yeah. Yeah. Right. Tell me, sorry, it's annoying me. The probability has to be inside the sum. Oh, sorry. God. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes my brain, like, shuffles things around without my knowing. 
Alright, second objection that I have, right? Okay, let's say that we might not be able to assume linearity. What about this condition here, that it preserves trace of all matrices, right? Why should we assume that? Because all that we really need is that it preserves trace of matrices that live in here, right? So, preservation of trace without linearity of the map, right? is unnecessary. That's the same way you're supposed to like this linear. If it's linear, then right, you can normalize, right, use linearity and then go back. Right. Yeah. So that's that's a good point. If it's linear and it preserves trace of states, since a basis of the state sits inside the, the, the states, right, we can just extend it by linearity and show that the map preserves trace of all linear maps. But if we don't have linearity, let's say we just have convexity, right? We don't have this anymore. And now this. Let's look at this. So let me look at this map, epsilon tensor, the identity. Um, so what's, what's my problem with this? Uh, what does this map say? This map says if I attach larger portions of the universe to my, my, my uh, space and interest, right? And then I do whatever I'm going to do, and the rest of the universe just stays still, right, and does nothing, then I'm going to get a positive map, right? Well, why the hell should I assume that I can, right, do what I do, and the rest of the universe is just static, right? I mean, I could see why you might say, I want this to be a case that holds true, right? But to say that the maps defined in this way are all of the maps that are physically reasonable, right? Seems seems a little this, this assumption right here seems a little weird, you know, sort of in no, that context. So yeah. that part I don't mind because if it preserves it for the, for these things for the identities, then you preserve it for anything else. No, we're all right, but that requires proof, right? So I'm, yeah, I'm that saying, proof, I mean, right? But that proof is usually done, right? Yes, books. yes. Yes. So, what I'm saying is, this is a typical exposition that you're first exposed to, right? And it's kind of, it kind of pulls the wool over your eyes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, because you can only attach finite dimensional epsilons, mm -hmm. but if you really want to see that the rest of the universe shouldn't be restricted to the finite dimensions. That's true. That's true. Well, we're going to assume in this case that we're living in a finite dimensional universe. Yeah, okay. we're yeah we're living in a finite dimensional universe. We're, we're, we'll just make the assumption, right, that the the Hilbert space that there is a Hilbert space that is everything that's closed, right? So we'll we'll foul at the altar of the church of larger Hilbert space. Who um, knows? Uh, number of states in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it, it's it's due to the ten to the seventy-nine. <laughs> but okay, so I call this I, I started calling this internally right now egocentric expansion <laughs> because it says what happens in the rest of the universe doesn't matter just what I do right <laughs> so so these are all concerns right that that uh one might pose, right? So, so where do the concern? Where are the concerns, right? Here, right in the definition. Um, here, right, and and here, right. And and what is it? That's basically the entire definition, right? That's basically the entire justification of the definition that that one might take issue to. So, what's the right way to do this? Well, the right way to do this is I'll go over here. For that. The right way to do this is what? Well, Stein string, right? So, what do we do? We have a space in our, uh, a state in our space of interest, and we fix some environment, right? That's the rest of, that's everything else, right? We assume that we can, we assume that this sits in some larger closed system, right? And then we we embed this in 
that system. And this is everything else, right, outside of our system. So some fixed environment. And then we fix some unitary evolution U on the combined space. Right, so on the combined space. And what do we do? We take this space, we send it up by the map that tensors it with the environment. And now we unitarily evolve this. Right, into something else. And then we trace out the environment. And now we see if there's a map here, right? And this map, you can prove, is completely positive trace preserving, right? So we can prove epsilon is a completely positive trace preserving map in this setting. Now, does anyone have any questions or concerns about this? A, a comment. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you, and that's exactly why what Chris was talking about yesterday, this, this diagrammatic presentation of Salinger is so nice, because it's, it's, it's that on the nose. Yeah, right. And it just applies to anything. You don't have to consider underlying linear structure of your right. build space. It just applies to everything. It applies that idea to anything. With a, with a tiny extra addition, which you could do here, is mm -hmm. to not just take unitarity, mm -hmm. but linearity. Because if you allow yourself to do things stochastically, then by means of, a, say, a POV, like a generalized measurement, you can impose any linear map, just not any unit. Okay, all right, so any linear. You could, you could, and then you don't get anything more general, ultimately. Mm. You still get the same family of, of channels. Okay. But it's sort of, it, it's kind of more elegant not to have to impose this unitarity from the start. No, I agree. It's, it's much nicer to start from here and, like you said, with, with this more general structure yeah. without assuming a linear structure. Yeah. 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 I mean, what does Bob mean by yeah, linear? Yeah, uh -huh. huh? Bob, there's a question for you. What? Well, Andre, is that's what I would say linear. No, I mean, like, this doesn't have to happen, say, in the category of Hilbert space and linear maps. This, this idea can apply to any other thing. Should you make a statement a bit more precise? Which idea? I mean, like Selin, the, the thing Chris was talking about yesterday, this construction of completely positive maps from underlying deterministic maps. Okay, I guess we can figure this out yeah. like afterwards. Yeah. Okay, so any concerns or anything about this, you know? Well, maybe a good thing to notice is this also works for infinite dimensional. This does, this does, yeah, that's, that's right. But, so, <laughs> room, yeah, it's not really a concern, right? It's just, more, more advertising types right, for this, this <laughs> construction. So remember that usually a, a lot of people, I'm not saying anyone here subscribes to this belief, also some might, um, but, but it's commonly said that the completely positive trace preserving maps represent all physical operations that you can do, right? So if I have a state and I write down a density operator for it and then I do whatever I can do to it, right? It, it, as long as it's a, a fixed, like, evolution, right, that no matter what state I have written down, I put it through this fixed evolution, right, on the other end, out comes another state, and the map that describes my input to that output is a CPTP map, right, that's, that's what a lot of people say, right, this, this is all the physical things that I can do, these things. So, let's, let's look then at, at what assumptions are here. Well, for one, right, we are subscribing to the church of the larger Hilbert space, right? Which I don't necessarily have a problem with. Well, for those who don't know, the church of the larger Hilbert space just says that if you have a quantum mechanical system and it's not closed, that it sits inside, if you attach enough stuff in the universe to your system, you'll eventually get to one that is closed, right? And a, a justification for that might be, well, I'll just take the, the system that represents everything in the universe, right? And that's got to be closed. Um, which, I don't know why that's got to be closed, but, you know, 
Sure, I'll, I'm, I'm fine with making that assumption at least. What, what, does, what, what does closed mean? Closed just means that the system doesn't interact with anything outside of it. It obeys the rules of quantum mechanics internally, and there's nothing outside that that well, there's no you extra. Can ignore whatever's outside. Right, you can ignore whatever's outside. There's no extra ambient environment that it interacts with. Presumably, it means its evolution is unitary. Yes. Mm -hmm. No. No. Well, if you assume that it started in a pure state, then it will be in a pure state. It will be because it will be hard to interpret it was in a mixed state. Right. Whose lack of knowledge is that? Right. That that gets into some uh, philosophical issues we're not going to touch in this talk. <laughs> is if the universe started in a mixed state? That uh, uh, that might be nonsense. Even I don't know, but. <laughs> It's interesting to think about. All right, so first, we, we are appealing to the church, church of the larger Hilbert space here, right, to get this unitary evolution on the larger combined system. Second, we're assuming that the system and environment are in a pure tensor product. Are we'll say a pure tensor product, right? Now, it's definitely possible for us to have a pure state, even right up here in this closed system, that can't be written as a pure tensor product here. Now, why should we believe that whatever state we have, we can just tensor it to the state that represents the environment and get the environment and system combined, right? This is an assumption that we make here. And the question, one question is, is that a valid assumption? Does anybody know? Is that, how do we justify that? So what does this mean? <laughs> so to say you can do that means you can regard them as being separate and yes. not interacting. Mm -hmm. But you could presumably do that at an intermediate stage in your description where you first say, well, they're just there, and then they start coupling and reacting, that's presumably the, the horizontal line on top. Mm -hmm. And so, as a fictional intermediate state, it's, it's okay. You think that that's actually physically real, maybe there's a bit of a threat. Mm -hmm. The two corners seem to be moving. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll, I'll draw a few more diagrams up in a, a second. Two more corners. <laughs> <But> yeah. <laughs> no, with uh, actually the same amount of, well, yeah, same amount of Okay. that was given by a visitor to NRL, uh, Cesar 
Rodriguez. <laughs> Rosario, who, uh, who did some work on not completely positive linear maps uh, that are physically meaningful. Right? So, so what is it that, that he did? So instead of this picture here, right, let's instead of assuming that the, the system and environment right, are in a pure tensor product, let's just write down. I thought I heard a whistle. Was that a bird? That's a bird. Okay. Right. Let's just write down some state, some combined state. And what do we have? If we trace out the environment and just look at what we have in the system, we've got what, what we've got, right? And then we assume some, of course, this, this we're assuming is closed again, and we evolve it unitarily, and then trace out the environment here. Right, and the question is, what can we say about this thing, right? Is there anything that we can say? Now, of course, this map, this, this, there, we might not even have a well-defined map here, right? Because you can imagine lots of different states up here that will trace out to the same state down here, right? And then when you evolve it, there's no reason the state that you get in the end would agree. So, so what did Cesar do? He he asked the question, is there a way for me to go up here? It, I, I think other people would ask the question before him, too. They posed the question. The way that he did it was, he said, is there a way that I can make an assignment map that assigns each state, each allowable state, right? Because now we're not going to, we might not be able to get all the states. You know, it's, we might not be able to get, for instance, pure states if we're assuming correlation in the, in the combined system. So, for every allowable state, is there a way for me to uniquely embed it here and then make this entire thing work? So, that's what he did. He took a state and he, I'm not going to go into the details of what this assignment map is that he wrote down, but basically what it, it does is it takes, it breaks the system and bath down into, it, you pick a basis out of the system and bath to use. And then you embed this using that basis, using projectors along the basis of this of the of the system, and attach it to the bath. So he came up with a linear assignment map here, and then after that, it was just composition. After that, it was just composition of these functions for him to get his channel. And he showed that these, because his assignment map was linear, this, this operator was linear, but he wrote down uh, a physically meaningful channel that was not completely positive. Right? So there were negative eigenvalues there. So, so is this a retraction with respect to this upwards map? With respect to what? So upwards map. I mean, if you start oh, to low, go up and down, you get the end you started. Yeah, yeah. If you if you embed and then trace out, yeah, you so get what you started. Yeah. Is is there a unique way to go up, or there are many ways yeah. to go up? No, there are so, many ways to go up. Does that does that mean that, does that mean the map epsilon is not unique as well? Or? Epsilon is unique once the assignment map is defined. Okay. But the assignment map depends. The way he constructed it, it depends on the the basis that you choose for the system and the map. Okay. 
said that again. Okay. So again. Um, you have many states for see which place ought to go as many other states for what I see place ought to roll in the But this evolution that we talked about was not necessarily take all the states that trace out to roll as to all right. the states that trace out. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact it will it will rarely. It would be shocking, actually, if you found a lot of them that, that actually did that. Outside of this setting. So, this was, this was an example where if we remove the assumption right, that the system and environment are an appearance or product to start with, that you might not get complete positivity, right? So, I just, and, and, and Cesar gave an uh, interesting anecdote. I, I probably shouldn't repeat his anecdotes, right? But like apparently, the first, Don't use me. Right, the first time he used this, he, he, he gave a talk on this, a very uh, prominent you know, mathematical physicist was, was a bored in the audience and stood up and, and yelled at them for half an hour about how, how these things you know, weren't, they had to be completely positive, trace preserving maps. So it's obvious that some people in the community think that Cesar went too far, right? He went too far with this. I think Cesar did not go too far enough. <laughs> because there are lots of other assumptions that we have written down, right? And why, why should we make those? So, so let me draw up. So what's the physical example, by the way? Of the um, map that gives you something? Here, I'll, I'll write down what the map is. It's not going to be very instructive, though. I was hoping for just like a quick physical description. Oh, no, no, there's no... I don't have a quick physical description of it. I understand it very well. I see. So I thought you said it was actually a physically realizable map. It is. I don't see one good example. It's like when you have error in preparation. Yeah. I'd like to see the A map. The A map? Yeah. The assignment map. The assignment map, uh, the way you constructed it was. here, 
right, I'm appealing to the church of the larger Hilbert space here. I don't necessarily have to. I'll, if I have time later, I'll just I'll, I'll draw something that allows me not to. But here I say I make my preparation, right, on my my system that I've plucked out. Right. Um, I could assume, for instance, that uh, my my preparation procedure, right, doesn't take any time. Maybe, for instance, go on and just apply why I can do this tensor product math. Um, but I don't want to do that, right? Look, like later on, I'll draw something that uh, allows me not to to assume that. Now, I've got this, where when I trace out the environment. And here I'll say, here I'll say I've prepared right, this state now. Now what do I do? Of course, this undergoes some unitary evolution. And then when I trace out the environment, I want to ask, what can I say about this here? Right, so so this seems this seems uh, a pretty general framework. So the arrow that I said that I might draw, which I'm not going to consider, this is that underlying everything is some fixed unitary evolution, right? Some fixed unitary over everything, in that these maps, right, like this one here, undergoes this evolution. When I go from here to here. I go. I undergo this evolution simultaneously with this evolution to arrive to here. So that's an assumption that I would like to make eventually, but not for the purposes of this. I think this is enough to to talk about um, what I want to talk about. So what can happen here? Let me write down a concrete example of something that happens here. So let me assume that my system is just a two-level quantum system. And my environment is also a two-level quantum system. And let me assume that they start out initially in a completely mixed state. So I'll say for instance, like, I'll just say completely mixed. Or what I think completely mixed. Maximally entangled. Way different. Completely different. Yes. <laughs> not, not locally. <laughs> okay, I'll assume that row SC starts out maximally entangled. And now, I'm going to assume P is a projective measurement. Seems reasonable for me. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to prepare pure states in my system. So I plug my system out. I perform a projective measurement in some basis that I choose. Outcomes, right, two things. And then I look at what that is, and then I send it over to Jamie, right? And, and then Jamie looks at what he gets. So. Now, when I perform a projective measurement, I'll say, I'll call, uh, no, I won't, I won't say anything at this stage. So I'll get something here. Okay, see, right, unitary, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens when I pre perform a projective measurement? Well, let's say, let's say, P is a measurement in the zero one basis. Right? Now, what happens when I perform this? Well, then I'll get either zero one or one zero as an outcome of my measurement. Right? And now, when I send my state through, so, so all the things here, 
right? All the things here. looks like, I'll say, x, y, where x and y are orthogonal, right? Where x and i are orthogonal pure states. So all the things that are, that are here look like this now. And when I prepare an x and I send it through, what happens? I have x, it embeds up as xy, and then I do a unitary evolution, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so you're saying you, you, you take your system, mm -hmm. 
right? And you, and you prepare the steak, right? And then you let it evolve. And then you're saying that thing cannot be understood as a, a convex linear function from the state to the system. I think you could say it's in the system. Right. Right. So they don't have to consider the whole. Yeah. Right. Right. Not only right. Not only is it not linear. It's not convex linear even. Right. So. So. When I was saying earlier, right, if I prepare things and send them through in the statistical ensemble through the channel, what I expect in the end should be, right? That's why I was saying that reeks of classical reasoning, right? Which, which I don't buy, right? I don't buy that justification, and that's why. That's why I don't buy it. Um, but right, in this case, the, the reason it's not, I would think that the reason that it's not linear is because we're doing a measurement here, right? This is measurement right here. And as we're preparing our system, we also, we alter the environment, right? So that thing that I had written down earlier where, right, that thing I had written down earlier where we had a fixed environment, right, and then we took our system and tensored it to it, right? What I'm saying is, well, depending on the different states here, right, we would get a different environment here if they're correlated, if the two systems were correlated before we prepared our system. Uh, Tony, yeah. are you even sure of the map, that the word map stays is this even well-defined no, thing no, you no. obtained? In, in general, it won't be well-defined. Right? Right. Right. I would even think that it's, com that it's like completely undefined, that it's just completely arbitrary, so there's nothing like a map. Right, right, right. So, in the end... What's the scrap map? Right, and in the end it will be Right. No, you're right, you're right, right? We can get rid of that too. <laughs> so, um, that's, that, that's what I wanted to talk about. If anyone wants to... <laughs> you talked about nothing. Right. <laughs> Well, mainly what I wanted to talk about was um, I, I wanted to, to just highlight this notion, right? This, there seems to be so much focus placed on completely positive trace-preserving maps, and also they, they are they they're very important maps. They're very important operations for us to understand. They're not everything, is what I'm trying to say, right? They're not all the things that we can physically do, right? Is, is what I'm trying to say, and and I feel like a lot of talks that I see seem geared on replicating CPTP maps in some some sense, right? And and I you know I I worry sometimes that as you know e even with like reformulations of quantum mechanics, right, that there's too much emphasis placed on getting CPTP maps out, right, from axioms. And and I don't necessarily think that that these are re th these are useful because we can get our hands on them, we can understand them, right? They're mathematically a lot easier than this very more general structure, right? but but to think that they're they're uh, I feel like people are putting an emphasis that makes them seem more foundational than they are. Um, so that that's my talk. If anyone wants to convince me that. So if anyone wants to convince me that CPTP maps are the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> so you wrote there that epsilon goes from mn to mn. Mm -hmm. If you read the original papers, they sometimes just state what they call operating si operator systems. Mm -hmm. so that's the thing called the cones of self joint parts of the algebra, like, or an algebra or something. Mm -hmm. And then the linearity is sort of kept out of the picture. Okay. So you're suggesting we should do that instead? Uh, possibly. I'm not familiar with this approach. So. Operator systems? Operator systems, they call them. Okay, no, I'm not familiar with this approach, but from, from that setting, I guess we derive linearity out of it's an assumption, yeah. okay. which is mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that might be a good time to work in to strike linearity. Um, so, yeah, that was interesting. It, it's, it seems to me that if you're going to that, that, that maybe you're okay using completely positive trace, uh, I'd say trace non-increasing maps, because that's more general. Okay. Uh, so long as you stick within the right framework. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and so one example of a framework that I think would be okay would be a sort of circuit framework. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about a circuit framework is, is you have a line, if you have a line going from one place to another, it, it limits what you can do. Um, 
you know, there's a sort of lines that will tell you about interactions. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're, you're, you're defining them in such a way that uh, is the, the normal definition with respect to those, those uh, interactions, then I, my, my feeling is that it would be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and like certainly in my own work, um, 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 if, you, if, you, if you define this circuit framework in sort of sufficiently general terms, um, so in particular, if you give it, if you say that circuits have the property um, that a closed circuit, having no wires left open, has a probability associated with it that doesn't depend on either the the, the settings or outcomes on any other circuit, um, then. Um, then my feeling is that that's sufficient to, to get the, the machine going. It feels like that would be enough. It, 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 it seems like if you can make enough assumptions to isolate, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah, iso the isolation assumptions. Right. Yeah, some isolation, isolation assumptions. Isolation is well-definedness. What's that? Uh, isolation is well-definedness, and that's exactly what right. I think. Yeah, well-definedness yeah. of probability. Yeah. If, yeah. if, if yes. you can justify this, right, right? If you can justify being able to do this, yeah. then, then I would say you can use completely positive trace not increasing or trace of learning. So, so then the question is whether those frameworks within which they do work, mm -hmm. is, is, the question is whether those frameworks in which they do work, whether, whether they're rich enough to cover all the physics mm -hmm. that you might be interested in. Right. Uh, if yeah. they are, then I think we're okay. Yeah. If, if there are situations where that doesn't work, then, then we have a problem. Yeah, there's somebody at, uh, in, in the group at uh, the Naval Research Lab who's trying to show that none of this matters, right? Mm -hmm. that, that he's trying to prove that in the real world operates this way close enough that we can use CP maps. And I, I don't think he's going to succeed. <laughs> not just not to put it down. Maybe not the real world, but the world is the experimentalist idealized laboratory. Here, here's a thing, though, is that, you know, in experiments, like when you do tomography on things, right, you almost all the time, you don't get a state out in the end, which suggests that, and, and experimentalists say, Right, that it's because of error in preparation, error in measurement, right, and error in circuit design. Idealized. What's that? Idealized. Idealized, right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, maybe these errors aren't just coming from right measurement error and, and preparation error and things like that. Maybe there's something more foundational going on that's leading to right you not being able to reconstruct a density operator out at the end. I, I, I could imagine actually kind of a, a research stack that. You basically use domain theory to sort of see the approximation of your CP map mm -hmm. by this kind of, un because it's really, un you're ta talking about undefined stuff, mm -hmm. not, not, not well-defined stuff, and you're trying to approximate something which is well-defined, because otherwise you're really do not doing anything. So, uh, and well, that's what the main theory does for you, like approximation. Uh, that, I think in scientific practice it would be like the, the way how you can actually approximate the ideal of completely positive trace preserving. It's like approximating the scientific hypothesis of have working with uh, isolated stuff which, which actually you never really have. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe the point would be to extend from a separated case where things work to a larger domain when you get things Oh, and by the way, don't think Caesar's got this result, right? It shows you can get complete positivity in right. more, you know, in more cases than just that, right? Okay. Right. I don't remember what the result is. I don't get to yeah. 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 It's like some kind of like convex sum of separable things. Right? Uh -huh. it's something like that. Right. Right. There's a, so, what, some, some measure of correlation, right? Yeah. It's like, it's not uncorrelated. I forget exactly how he called them. But he did show, his example did show a separable state in the combined system that led to a not completely positive map. So separability isn't sufficient, right, to, to assume, to get CP out. There's another kind of assumption that you have the identity matrix. It's not mm. really a really physical thing. Mm. You can't the right. system is only to do something on the That's true. I guess we... What role does that play in? I guess it, the... Right, this, like, the, the more general setting that, that I would like to look at is if we have a unitary operator up here, right, that we assume, like, you know, the universe is on, like, you know, but it, it evolves on its own, right, outside of what we do. And then we add in the things that we do, and we have no influence out there. And then the combined evolution, right, describes all the possible things that we can actually do. But I think that's, you know, 
so, so the identity there would just be we can't do things to things that are outside of our control, but the universe just sort of carries it along on its own. But um, I think b before looking at this, looking at this, right, yeah, it's hard enough already. <laughs> Oh no, you're right. You're right. Um, so if you do a measurement on your subsystem, you surely get a back reaction of the universe. Right. No, that's true. That's and true. therefore, there cannot be an identity uh, because what you do yeah. to the system that somehow has to influence. So yeah. Yeah. That's true. So I should not write it like this, right, and just say this is a projective measurement. Right. I'll perform a projective measurement here. Or not just a projective measurement, some preparation, right? That could include measurements of any sort that we can that we can do. In thermodynamics you have the problem to define a thermodynamic system out of a stochastic underlying and not any subsystem is thermodynamical. So, the thermodynamic. so here I, I think you, you would need to have a sort of notion of system for them to say what is a separated part of the whole universe. Yeah? And that may not be everything because there may be things which you just cannot separate this out. you can figure it out because you have access to the underlying stochastic mm -hmm. uh, model. Right. So you can look at Boltzmann and kinematics and show when the system is not an